Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, today's seminar. So we are very happy to have uh, Sridhi Pal from Princeton to tell us about uh, his work on automorphic spectra and the conformal bootstrap. So Sridhi, please take it away. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, uh, today I'll, I'll be going to talk about the automorphic spectra and the conformal bootstrap. So this is a work uh, based on this paper. Uh, this, is a, this will be a talk uh, based on this work with Peter Krapchuk and, and Dalimin Mazak, both of whom were, were here at IS. So we all know about the, conform, the ideas of conformal bootstrap is basically an idea where you use the crossing symmetry to put constraint on the data of a conformal field theory. Uh, which basically means constraining the spectra of operators appearing in conformal field theory, putting bounds on OP coefficients, and so on. So basically, you can solve a conformal field theory by putting this putting these consistency conditions. So here we will. So today, my job will be to explain the other part of the title, which is automorphic spectra. Uh, so so we will see that the 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 same sim similar ideas also appear in the lab. And of automorph in the land or in the realm of automorphic spectra, which is basically a generalization of periodic functions defined on some group manifold. And of course, here uh, the relevant group manifold would be the group manifold of conformal group. And we will see that the same notions of OP, the Hilbert space of operators, and everything will reappear in the context of automorphic spectra. And there will be an emergent, so given a d-dimensional manifold. We can always define a d minus one dimensional emergent space time on which this operator sleeps and the conformal group acts. And we will have a notion of OP. And at the end of the day, we will put some bounds and constraints on the, on the data, in this case, which is the automorphic spectra. So as we go along, the things will be much more clearer. But the, the, the main lesson would be to use the ideas from conformal bootstrap and apply this in a completely different context, which is the, which is the, the, the spectra of automorphic forms. And, and we'll see how, the, how we can treat the, the, this, this land of automorphic spectra as a toy model for conformal bootstrap. And please feel free to ask questions at any point um, that, as I want to make the talk very accessible. So, so to, to go ahead, so what, so as I was saying that we have these two things here and on the, on the left side, on the, on, the, on the red diamond, we have the spectral geometry of a D-dimensional hyperbolic manifold. And on the green side, we have the conformal bootstrap in D minus one dimension. And our objective in this talk is to show the remarkably precise connection between these two guys, which is made possible by this group SO1 comma D. So on the green side, it acts as a Euclidean conformal group. And on the red side, this is basically the isometric group of the hyperbolic manifold. And because in both cases, the, the same unitary irreps appear, and there is, there is a similarity in the consistency conditions, and we will see there is a remarkable connection between these two. And, and why do we care about this problem? And there, there are, it, the answer really depends on from which background you are coming from, what your motivation is. Like if you're a physicist, then, then the answer is that the, the spectral geometry of the hyperbolic manifold uh, offers you a toy model for conformal bootstrap. As I was saying that you, like we, we, are, we are able to, able to find out a spectrum, um, uh, define a Hilbert space of operators and the notions of OP and everything. So, so all the notions you are familiar with in the context of conformal field theory also appear here. And then you can ask many questions which are apparently hard in this context, but might be easier on this context. For example, uh, a natural question is that, can we define chaos in a CFD? Like, is there like, can crossing provide a solution which exhibit chaotic features? So in the, in the actual conformal field theory context, this might be a very hard question to answer, but on the spectral geometry context, it, it, it can offer us some insight and at least that's our hope. 
And, and this is a legitimate hope because we know on the hyperbolic manifold, classically all geodesic motions diverge. So there is a notion of chaos and this also manifests itself when you solve the Laplacian spectra on the hyperbolic manifold. So, so the spectral geometry do contain, geometry does contain some information about the chaos in the Laplacian eigenspectra. And the hope is one can set up a crossing problem on, on in this setup and the crossing might provide a solution which can pinpoint those chaotic features. And that will give us some insight about the original problem in the conformal field theory. So that's the physics and motivation to, to have a geometric model of conformal field theory. And if you're coming from a math background, then, then, then also there are ample motivations because there are unproven conjectures in mathematics literature uh, about the gap in the Laplacian spectra on this kind of manifolds. And, and for example, there's a conjecture in genus two, there's a surface called Bolsa surface, which maximizes the gap in the Laplacian spectra. In same way in genus three, there's a conjecture that there's a surface called Klein quartic, which maximizes the gap in the Laplacian spectra. So all these kind of problem can be attacked very nicely using the bootstrap because what you do in the bootstrap is basically you put an upper bound on the Laplacian gap. And then all you need to show that the upper bound is saturated by these kind of surfaces. And then you are done. You are basically proving those conjectures. And we, as you will see that from the numerical level, we, we go very close to proving these conjectures because all of our upper bounds are very nearly saturated, like up to several decimal places. Uh, by these uh, by these surfaces, which are conjectured to maximize the gap, and finally there is a possible connection with the D seater bootstrap, which have we, we have not really explored this connection. But the basic idea is the in, even in the D seater bootstrap, you look at late time correlators in the D seater, and those correlators also enjoy this SO one comma D symmetry. So the same kind of crossing equations you can write down. You can write down the same kind of crossing equation in the D seater bootstrap setup as well. So the consistency conditions we use on a mathematical level also, also applies to this setup. So these are mostly our motivation. And, and, and in general, this whole framework is going to work for all SO1 comma D, like if you're working in D-dimensional hyperbolic manifold. But for the rest of the talk, I will focus on the simplest case, which is D equals two, which is which is simple but rich enough to exhibit a lot of features. So I'll be focusing on hyperbolic surfaces. So let us think about the hyperbolic surface. How can how 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 do we how do we think about hyperbolic surface? So there is a nice uh, group theoretic way to construct any hyperbolic surface, which is basically you take the upper half plane H and put the put the metric the hyperbolic metric on it. And then the idea is to quotient it by some group gamma, which is a discrete subgroup of PSL 2 one And so what happens that, like if you just think of the upper half plane, the isometric group of the upper half plane is SO1 comma two, which is if you think about the orientation preserving isometric group, then this is a subgroup of SO1 comma D and this is PSL 2 r So PSL 2 r takes you from a point on the upper half plane to a different point on the upper half plane. And then you can think of a, of a gamma, which is a discrete subgroup of PSL 2 r So gamma also takes a point from a point of, from the upper half plane to a different point. And when you quotient by this gamma, you are basically identified these two points. And by this way, you can create all the, um, all the connected hyperbolic surfaces. And, 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 the, and the, then the idea is if gamma does not contain any parabolic element, then the hyperbolic surface is compact. So in this talk, I will only be focusing on the compact hyperbolic surface. And the reason will be very clear soon why compact is compactness is needed. And, and, the, and, and the lesson I want to tell you from this slide is that when you want a compact hyperbolic surface, you want your discrete subgroup gamma to not contain any parabolic element. And, and, and just to make things clear that gamma has, can have three kinds of elements, the parabolic, elliptic, and hyperbolic. The parabolic elements are conjugate to translation, the elliptic ones are conjugate to rotation, and the hyperbolic ones are conjugate to scaling. 
So we do not want any parabolic element inside gamma, but we can have elliptic elements and hyperbolic elements. And on top of that, if we have elliptic elements inside gamma, then the hyperbolic surface that we obtain can have orbital points. So, so when I, in this talk, when I will be saying about hyperbolic surface, I, I do mean hyperbolic orbifolds and hyperbolic manifolds. The orbifolds and manifolds are treated on the same footing in, in, the, in, in, this, in this talk or in this work. So to move ahead, so now we need to define the, the, the automorphic forms and uh, the automorphic spectra, and in particular, the Laplacian spectra. So, so how do we define the Laplacian? So the Laplacian on the upper half plane is defined by this operator, which is basically this Y square factor comes from the matrix. And then, then we generally, like if you think of the full hyperbolic upper half plane, then the spectra is continuous and you can solve the, solve this eigen, eigen equation and then you will get some eigenfunction and continuous spectrum. And then the PSL2 acts on these functions and 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 gives and takes you from so you it will take you from this function to a different function when it act, when it when it is acted by the gamma. But now you are defining the the Laplacian on a compact hyperbolic surface. And the compact hyperbolic surface is given by this gamma slash h. So, so solving the Laplacian on this surface amounts to looking for eigenvalues corresponding to gamma invariant eigenfunctions of Laplacian. So the so is is basically like how you solve a pre, like a Laplacian on a real line with a periodic boundary condition. You solve for all the eigenfunctions and then pick out the functions which are periodic. So here also you are solving for the Laplacian equation on the upper half plane, and then picking out those eigenfunctions which are gamma invariant, and then there is a corresponding eigenvalue. And now comes the part why we need the compactness. Because we have a compact surface, we know the Laplacian spectrum is discrete. So there is a, there is a lambda zero, lambda one, and lambda two. So there is a discrete set of eigenvalues. It's not continuum anymore. And because it's compact, it also has a finite volume. So the lowest eigenvalue is always zero, which corresponds to the constant function defined on the on that surface. And because the surface has finite volume, this this constant eigenfunction do uh, eigenfunction does belong to the L two space. And because we have a continuous spectrum, it makes sense to ask that what is the maximum gap. So. So concretely and technically, our goal would be like on a mathematical level, our goal would be to put bound on this number lambda one, given a compact hyperbolic surface. So is that clear? Okay. Okay. So at this point, you might ask that why do we expect a bound at all? Like to begin with, like why there should be some constraint, and the and the, and the most non-sophisticated way to understand this is to define is to way is to use this approach by Hinterbichler and Bonifacio, where they define something called a triple overlap integral, where basically you take this a phi f j f k, so which are eigenfunctions and of this Laplacian on the hyperbolic manifold. And they are orthogonal to each other, and then you define like product of these three functions and integrate over the whole manifold, and then you get a number which you define at c i j k, and this whole equation can be recasted in this form, which is basically you take two functions f i f j, you multiply them together, and again expand in the eigenbasis of Laplacian. You can always do that. And then there will be some coefficients appearing with each of the eigenfunctions uh, on the on the right hand side, and these are precisely c i j k, which which looks like the three point like three point op coefficients. But at this point, the 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 structure of op and op and the Hilbert space of operators like those notions are not yet clear. So at this point, we are only looking at a level of functions. So once we have these kind of things, we can do the following trick. So we can consider a four point function in some sense, which basically like which is which basically amounts to taking fi, fi, fj, fj, 
you multiply these four functions together and then integrate over the manifold. Now to evaluate this integral, you can proceed in two different ways. First, what you can do, you can take this first one and the third one, fi and fj, and fuse them together by this equation and, and use the expansion to write a cijk fk, this sum over here. And once you have written the sum, then you can again see there is a fk, fi, fj, and there's an integral. So you exchange the sum and the integral like this. And once you do this, you have another triple point integral, which involves fk, fi, and fj. And so you get another cijk. So basically everything boils down to a sum, which is sum over c, I, c square ijk. You can do it in another channel where you fuse fi and fi and fj and fj. And if you do that, at the end of the day, you will get a sum which involves cijk, cjjk. And we know that in, like, in whichever way you do this expansion, at the end of the day, it is evaluating the same function, which is the four point function. They has to be same. And that gives you an equation, which is like a crossing equation, which tells you that at sum over k is, yes. Sorry, so this function is a arbitrary function or it has to be holomorphic or anti-homomorphic? So this is uh, right now the only the constraint is that these functions are the eigenfunctions of Laplacian. So it doesn't have to be holomorphic or anti-holomorphic. Or yeah, in fact, then they are not, as you will see later. Okay, but Laplacian in this case is uh, dx squared plus dy squared, right? Laplacian in this case is this one. So they are. It's like holomorphic function. Probably because it's like dz dz bar, right? Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, but there is a y square also uh -huh. here. Okay. Okay. So you, yeah, but but you will see there is a close connection with the holomorphic form. So at the end of the talk, you will like as we go along the talk within probably fifteen minutes, you will see the holomorphic forms and the anti-holomorphic forms will also come into play. Okay. But they are not really the i eigenfunctions of Laplacian on the surface. So, okay, to, to answer your question, so the po point is the holomorphic forms and the anti-holomorphic forms, they are differential forms living on the surface. And these are functions living on the surface. So they are different quantities in some sense. Okay, good, good, good. I see. So this function is like a zero form, you mean? That's what you mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, in fact, you will see there is a, there is a, yeah. You, you, you will see, soon see that how these zero more than zero forms will appear in the bigger okay. context. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, I have a question so, yeah. to, about the measure. Mm -hmm. uh, so is this the measure that uh, makes the functions orthogonal to each other? Or so if you if you would just have two of these functions, are they then also so is there some orthogonality condition or yeah, yeah, yeah. If you so this like, is this particular measure that you're looking at. Yeah, yeah. So so I guess it's the other way around basically. So you you define your matrix so that the Ricky, the cross-sectional curvature is uh, the sectional curvature is minus one at every point, and then you define your eigenfunctions and they are orthonormal basically. Okay, they are automatic. So and here you also, uh, it's like only one integral and all the functions have the same uh, X value or- Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It's, the it's really the, the proper product. It's not a triple integral or something like that. It's a proper product, yeah, yeah. Okay. You, you take three functions, evaluate it at same point, multiply them and because all of them are L2 and then, and the, and the surface is compact. So this product is also in, inside L2. So you can integrate it and get a number. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, but, but soon you will see that, the, so this is a very brute force way to see there are crossing, why there are crossing equations. But at the end of the day, you will see when you define the Hilbert space of operators and OP and like everything will follow very naturally. And we don't have to talk about functions or forms at all, but that will come later. And, and so, so the main lesson from, from here is that one can write down crossing equations and because you have crossing equations, there's a chance that these crossing equations will put some constraint. 
And this is how Hinterbichler and Bonifacio obtain consistency conditions for Einsteinian manifold. And later, James also found some bounds for hyperbolic manifolds. But the connection with group theory and the connection with the actual conformal field theory was missing. And that's where we basically come in. We recast the whole problem uh, in the familiar language of conformal field theory. So we clarify what are the Hilbert space of operators and how the group acts and why there is an OP and why there is a consistency conditions at all. Okay, so, so, so as I was saying that we want to recast it in the modern incarnation of conformal bootstrap where we study the four point correlator and there is a notion of OP and there is an associativity of OP. So we want to, want to extract this kind of picture from the, from, the, from the automorphic forms and from the spectral geometry of hyperbolic manifold. So we want to define a four point correlator. We want to define a notion of OP. And, and ideally the associativity of functional multiplication will can be recast into some associativity in the some notion of OP and which will lead to crossing symmetry as we will see later. Okay. So, so once we do all these things before explaining the, explaining the details of how we do that, let me show you what we can achieve by doing this concretely. So, so here are the theorems we prove with all rigor, rigor. And so, so we could show that any hyperbolic map for any hyperbolic RV4, the first non-trivial Laplacian eigenvalue, lambda one, has to be less than this number, which is 44.8883537. And so this holds for any hyperbolic RV4s and manifolds. But then you can make your bound genus specific. So we also show that any hyperbolic orbifold of genus two must satisfy this bound, which is lambda one less than 3.838876481. In the same way, like you can do it for genus three and in genus three, this number is 2.6784 and so on. Now these numbers are quite spatial and, and, and because one can find some nearly saturating surface, which actually nearly saturated these numbers. For example, like there is an orbifold which has the smallest volume among all the hyperbolic orbifolds. And if you solve the lap, numerically solve the Laplacian equations on this orbifold with smallest volume, you can show that the, 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 the actual number from numerics is precisely 44.8883536. So you can see it's nearly saturates our bound. And of course there are infinite set of consistency conditions. We are only working with finite number of them. So we can only match up to finite decimal places, but still it's a remarkable match. In the same way, if you look at genus two Bolsa surface, then the, the value from the numerics is 3.838887258. And you can see our value is 3.838889 and so on. And for genus three, Klein quartic, the value from numerics is 2.6779. And here we have 2.6784 and so on. So all these things shows that our bounds are remarkably saturated, nearly saturated by some surface. So that's one part of the excitement. And another part of the excitement that there are like all our bootstrap bound based the best known previous bounds from the mass literature. For example, in the genus two, the, uh, the best previous bound was by Yang and Yao from a paper in 1980, where they show for genus two, this bound is four. And of course our bound is better than that. And for genus three, the best known bound only came last year by which is by Ross, not last year actually by this time, it's like 2020. Um, and his bound was 2.7085. And here our bound is slightly better than the bound by Ross. And all these bounds are the currently the best known analytical bound on the hyperbolic orbifolds. So, so the main thing I want to say here that the, these bootstrap bounds are like very constraining and they do produce the state of art bound in, 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 in at least for the lower genus cases. Okay. Sorry, I have two naive questions. The, yes. the first one is that, so this bounds doesn't, so, yeah, I, I have some questions about first the, the bound. This, yeah. I don't know much about it, but uh, is it like uh, like this hyperbolic uh, orbifold can saturate this value or the saturation is below this value? 
so the idea is that uh, the the saturating example would be for example for genus 2 boza this will be the saturate so the first of all the saturating value is looks like it's an irrational number uh -huh. but then you can when you do the numerics you cannot pinpoint the irrational numbers all you can do you can figure figure out this number some rational approximation up to some decimal places and oh. then you can then you can do the do the bootstrap bound and show that that this upper bound ideally you want to show that this upper bound matches with this numeric value in all decimal places but here you can show that our bound matches up till 3.8 up till four decimal places here and right. of course this number is has to be less than this number because ours is an upper bound right but here is like a nearly saturating surface right you, what you that the values are for yeah. is there maybe it's a stupid question but is there some saturating surface saying it tells me exactly what is the like this value is oh, oh i see so the point is so when i am saying nearly saturating i mean we can show that it's nearly saturating but if you plug in more equations then these numbers will decrease and match with these numbers. Uh -huh. Okay, okay, I see. So, so the conjecture is that the Bosa and the Klein quartic, these are the surface which saturate the bounds, which which has to which has to maximize the bound. Mm -hmm. And so, so you have these numbers here, and the our, our, our upper bound is on top of it, and. You can put more and more equations to push the upper bound down to the saturating value. Yes, yes, I got your idea. And the second question is that seems from some observation here, like when genus increases, the bound decreases. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a, a theorem or a, is still a conjecture or it's it's not? Uh, you, yeah. So the the so the you can show that as the genus increases, the upper bound has to increase, uh, upper bound has to decrease, that you can show rigorously. But given any genus, like there could be genus, sorry. But since the upper bound decreases, but the point is given any genus two or any genus three surface, there is no comparison. But you can always make this claim, the surface that maximizes the genus two gap has to be, has to have a Laplacian eigenvalue, which is bigger than the uh, the maximum gap for the genus three that you can show. Okay, so this monotonic behavior is proved, but uh, the precise value is not known for each case. It's, it's different from case to, from genus to genus. Yeah, yeah. So, so, the, so there is a monotonicity in the upper bound coming from the bootstrap. Okay, okay. And Great. that's kind of inbuilt in the setup. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So let us move ahead. And, and so for the rest of the talk, I will be explaining the connection with the conformal field theory. And, and to do that, we need to understand a bit better how to construct these hyperbolic orbifolds and how these surfaces are constructed and so on. So for the next few slides, I will I will do a brief detour of how these surfaces are constructed. So, so the first, uh, the simplest example of a hyperbolic surface is constructed with something called a triangle group. So, so you consider the upper half plane, and we all know the geodesics are basically these semicircles. And once these three semicircles intersect with each other, we get a triangle with angle alpha, beta, and gamma. And then if you arrange for this angles alpha, beta, gamma to be pi over some integer k1, k2, and k3, then you can consider a discrete group, which is generated by the reflection around these geodesics AB, BC, and AC. So this reflections forms a group, which is called the triangle group. And this will be a discrete group because these are k1, k2, k3 are integers. So so basically there are discrete number of elements. So, so basically, that basically it means if you do this reflection along these sides finite number of times, you will land up with identity. But because this reflection is not orientation preserving, so you want a subgroup of this triangle group, which is orientation preserving. 
And that means you always take pair of reflections. So basically you reflect around AC and then you reflect around BC and that forms a group element. So you can consider a orientation preserving index two subgroup inside this triangle group. And that's called Von Dyke group. And the idea is if you take upper up plane and the quotient by the Von Dyke group, then you get a genus zero surface with three orbifold singularities where the orbifold order is K1, K2, and K3. And in general, this signature of gamma or the signature is very important, and which is basically this data where you first write the genus and then you write the orbifold singularities if they have something. So, so this data tells you that how, like which genus you are at and how many orbifold points are there and what are their orders. And the orbifold with smallest volume has the signature, which is genus zero. And there are three singular points, which is two, three with orbifold order, two, three, and seven. And the second smallest ones correspond to zero and then two, three, and eight. And, and then, 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 as I was saying, this, this surface uh, maximizes the gap among all the hyperbolic surfaces and orbifolds in two dimension. And then the Bolza surface is constructed by these two, three, eight triangles, which is the second smallest hyperbolic orbifold. So the idea is you take 96 of these two, three, eight triangles and glue them together properly. So there are no orbifold singularities anymore. And the surface you land up with is called Bolza surface, which is basically the most symmetric surface uh, among all genus two surfaces. And this is what is conjectured to maximize the gap. And in the same way, you can consider a genus three Klein quartic surface, which is conjectured to be the most symmetric uh, genus three surface. And this is constructed by this three, three, 336 of these two, three, seven triangles and you glue them together properly. So there are no singular points, no orbifold points anymore. And you land up with a genus three surface. So in all our cases, what we see that our bounds are either saturated by, by, by either by zero, two, three, eight or zero, two, three, seven surfaces or some surface which can be constructed by gluing these things. So, so this, these three kinds of things play a crucial role in our setup. Is there a question? If not, let me go ahead and, and go back to our main problem that how do we bootstrap the hyperbolic surface? How do we construct the Hilbert space and so on? And so the first notion of Hilbert space that we can come up with is to define all the, declare that all the uh, square integral functions that lives inside the surface, which is H slash gamma, and declare it to be the Hilbert space. And of course it forms a L2, it, it's L2 space, it's, inti it's square integral functions. They do form a Hilbert space. But the problem is that the, the conformal group doesn't, does not act properly on this, on this uh, inside this. So, so the point is the conformal group acts on these guys and can take you outside this thing. So we want to construct a Hilbert space on which the conformal group acts nicely because on the back of our mind, we have conformal field theory where we have set of operators and the conformal group acts nicely is because the set of operators forms a representation of conformal group. But the whole point is this, this space of L2 integral functions on the hyperbolic surface is not a representation of conformal group. So we have to do something better. And and then the hint is in the fact that this upper up plane H is a homogeneous space. So we can think of it as a quotient of a group manifold. So you consider this group G, which is PSL2R. And then there is a stabilizer group of this PSL2R, which is K, which is basically SO2R, like the rotation modded out by plus minus identity. And once you do this quotient G over K, you get the, high, the upper half plane H. Now, instead of considering gamma slash H, you consider a, a one dimension, one higher dimensional space, which is gamma slash G. So you forget about this K and consider all the functions that live 
on this g slash gamma. And the claim is that this is not a representation of hyper of the conformal group, but this naturally falls under the representation of conformal group because the G that sits inside is precisely the conformal group PSL2. So basically we enlarge our, our space to make it a representation of PSL2. And, and, and pictorially what is happening, this is, this, this is a nice picture, like we can visualize it. So initially we have this surface X, which is basically a 2D surface and, a, and a, it might have some order for singularities. So initially every functions are the eigenfunctions that was living on this surface. And the claim was that the, the functions, the L2 integral functions that lives on the surface, they, they do not form a representation of PSL2. So for each point on this surface, you attach this extra direction, which is S1. And you consider this bigger space and this bigger space is precisely gamma slash G where G is PSL2. And then you define functions on this bigger space, which are now parameterized by three variables, X, Y, and theta, where X, Y, R, X, Y, R lives on this manifold. And this theta is this extra direction here. And, and all the L2 integral functions living on this total space forms form a representation of PSL2. So, and, and that can be shown very easily because we can define an inner product on this space. So you take two functions, F1 and F2 that lives on this bigger space, you integrate them together, like you multiply them together and integrate over the full total space, which is G slash comma. In the, and it form, and the fact it forms a representation of G that can also shown easily by this group multiplication where you take G tilde, it acts on this function F and it maps to a different function, which is the previous function evaluated at G, G tilde. Now the point is that because you know that how this group acts on this F, you can consider the algebra of this algebra corresponding to this PSL 2 r So let us consider the algebra. And the algebra has three generators. The complexified algebra has three generators, L0, L1, and L minus one. And, and you can show that this L0 generates the generates the this extra circle. So it, it takes care of the charge under this extra circle. And the L1, L minus one precisely acts like a derivative. In fact, you can, because you know this action, you can explicitly write down the differential operator. So which looks like this. So now, as I was saying that my functions lives on this total space and they are parameterized by X, Y, and theta. And we can write down the L1 and L minus one and also L zero, which I have not written down here as some differential operators, which depends on X, Y, and also the direction theta. And you can also write down the Casimir, which looks like this differential operator, which has Y square, times del x square plus del y square, and there is a cross term. So now I know how the, the PSL2 or the complexified PSL2 or algebra acts on the functions that lives inside uh, g slash gamma, the bigger space. So once we know this, we can make some crucial observations. And, and first of all, we can define some correlators, for example, to define the correlator, we basically take functions and multiply them together point-wise on the same point, and then integrate over the full space. And that defines my correlator on this Hilbert space. So now we have a Hilbert space and we also have a notion of correlators on that Hilbert space. And, and recall earlier, we also defined a triple overlap integral of three functions. And you will see that how those definitions matches with this definition when it is needed to match. And to, pre to be precise, let us do the following observation. So the first of first observation is if the function f is theta independent, which is this extra direction, then this reduces to the earlier definition of correlator of functions on the surface. So basically you have this definition of correlator now on the bigger space. Now you demand that 
your functions does not depend on this extra direction theta. So they descend down to the functions living on the surface. And because this extra direction is compact, you can integrate that out and you get your earlier definition, which is basically you take the functions on the surface, multiply them together, and you get a four point correlator. So now, so basically you can see there is a one-to-one -one connection that the, 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 so basically there is a connection that every function that lives on the surface can be live uplifted to a function which lives on the bigger space that does not depend on the theta. And then the, another crucial observation is that is the, if, if you take the Casimir and act on a function which is not theta, which is theta independent, then this precisely becomes the Laplacian acting on the function. So this means if you want to put some bounds on the Laplacian spectra, you have to put some bound on the Casimir acting on the, acting on some special part of the Hilbert space, which is where the functions are theta independent. So this is where we first made the connection with the group, with the group theory concept with a, with a purely geometric concept. So on this side, we have group theory, on this side, we have the uh, geometry and the Laplacian and so on. And then, then you can ask that what happens if my functions are not theta independent? And, and there comes the holomorphic forms and the anti-holomorphic forms. So to do that, you consider, you consider again, consider the space L2 G slash gamma. And because there is a direction, the, the theta direction or the circle direction, you can decompose this whole thing in this direct sum, which is Vn, where n denotes the charge under L0. So n is basically charge under L0. And when n equals zero, that precisely gives you the eigenfunctions. And when n not equals to zero, they involve the derivatives of the eigenfunctions and forms. And, and, and to be more precise, we can make this connection very explicit. You, you basically take these functions f x, y, theta, you parameterize it as y to the power n, e power minus i n theta, and some function h of x, y. And because this f is gamma invariant, you can ask how gamma acts on these functions h of x, comma y. And you will see that they precisely acts like a form with either minus 2n or plus 2n depending on the value of n. And on top of it, if we impose this condition that this f is annihilated by L1 or L minus one, again, I know how L1 and L minus one acts on this function as a differential operator. You can show that if these conditions are met, then this function h is either holomorphic or anti-holomorphic. So at the end of the day, what we have learned, we have learned that there are three kinds of objects living on the, on the surface, which are the holomorphic forms, anti-holomorphic forms, and the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. And all of them can be embedded as some functions, capital F, living on this bigger space, L2 gamma slash G. So whereas from the point of view of the surface, they are different objects, but on this bigger space, they are actual, they are all treated on the same footing because they are all functions. And that's the advantage of going to this bigger space because you can treat everything in one go. And because all of them together forms a representation, they are intricately related to each other. So once we have this basic thing, we can ask the following question, which is a very natural question to ask in the group theory context which is you take the Hilbert space of the bigger thing, which is G slash gamma. So L2 G slash gamma. And then you decompose this V into irreducible representation of PSL2. So now there are now from, for the PSL2, the, the, we know about all the irreps and what kind of irreps they can, they can appear. And let me briefly go over this thing. So of course you can have a trivial irrep, which is, isomorphic to complex numbers. And from the context, of, from the point of view of a surface, this is basically the unique identity or the constant function. So this belongs to the zero eigenvalue, corresponds to the zero eigenvalue. 
Then you have this uh, script DN and script DN bar, which is basically the lowest weight and the highest weight state. And I already told you the lowest weight and the highest weight state is defined by this fact that either L1 or L minus one annihilates the function. And in the previous slide, I already told you that when L1 F or L minus one F is zero, then these basically corresponds to the holomorphic forms or the anti-holomorphic forms living on the surface. So that means the guys that lives here is related to the holomorphic differential forms and the anti-holomorphic differential forms living on the surface. And not only that, if someone tells you some information about gamma, then there is a theorem called Riemann-Roch theorem, which precisely tells you how many of holomorphic forms of a given weight are there in this decomposition. So you know that there is a unique identity. You also know, given a weight n, how many of them are sitting here given some information about gamma because of Riemann rock. So these two parts are complete unknown with some, some, some detail because we know how many are there, what are the things and so on. Then there is a final part, which is the continuous representation, which are parameterized by this Casimir value lambda k. And, and these things are precisely related to the eigenfunctions. So this c lambda k, belongs to the zero mode, which is V zero. And to be precise, they also belongs to L two gamma slash H. And they are precisely the Laplacian eigenfunctions. And, and as earlier I showed that if the function is not theta independent, then the Casimir value is related to the eigenvalue of the Laplacian. So basically all we want to know that given some information about gamma, what are the possible values of lambda k that can appear in this decomposition? And all we want to do, we want to put a bound on lambda one. So basically at this point, I have, we have like recast our geometry problem, the spectral geometry problem into the problem of a group theory, where you take some Hilbert space, which, which, is, an, which is a representation of PSL2R, and then you do, do this decomposition and you ask what are the possible values of lambda k that can appear in this decomposition, given some information about gamma. So is that clear? Maybe one physical question is that, yeah. um, so for this complex C, I think it probably corresponds to vacuum. Yeah, yeah. And then this dn and dm bar looks like like one particle state, like chiral particles, right? More. Yeah. So there is yeah. So there is some there is some similarity with the so chiral rings and so on. Like if you take so so later we will define some operators involving these representations, and there the ops and everything somewhat mimics like the chiral ring of supersymmetry theories okay yeah, it's just the last part i don't know if it's it corresponds to say multi particle state or yeah this last part uh, no i guess i wouldn't so the so the thing is that like you can also view this problem as a as a quantum particle uh, so this part can be viewed as a particle, like you are solving a Schrodinger equation on hyperbolic surface. Mm -hmm. And this, then the Laplacian eigenfunctions are precisely the Schrodinger equations. Uh, and the Laplacian eigenvalue is the energy eigenvalues. So in some sense, like if you view that way, then these are basically the single particle states because you are actually solving a quantum particle living on the surface. Okay, okay. And this makes the system to be continuous, like this number k is a continuous uh, number. Oh, so okay, so no, so the so the point is, I am telling this is continuous series because of the following reason. So, if you so earlier I was telling you that you have to choose gamma in a specific way so that this surface is compact. But if you do not put any restriction of gamma to begin with, then this is always discrete and labeled by n, but this, this lambda k can, can be continuous. And that's why it is called continuous series. 
but once you implement the information that the gamma is a discrete group which does not have any parabolic element, then this is compact. And then the lambda case becomes discrete. And even if it's called continuous series, and then you want to put bound on lambda one. Okay, okay. So, the, so, so I guess it's a, it's, a, it's a confusion in the language. So the point is the fact it is continuous series means that there can be surfaces where non-compact surfaces where it is a continuum. Okay, okay. But even in those non-compact surfaces, this part is always discrete. Yeah, yeah. Now I feel this looks like some quantum correction, but I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> yeah, there are hints like that, but yeah, I am also not like it's yeah, like it's very hard to make those things precise. But I, yeah, I don't know how to make like think of this as a quantum correction and so on because like so the the most concrete thing I know is that you can. You can think of this as a prop, like this Laplacian problem as a problem of a particle, like solving Schrodinger equation on a hyperbolic surface. And then these eigenvalues are basically the energy eigenvalues. And then you go on from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you see why I'm saying this since this n more or less we can get from L0, right? Level. Yes, so this, yeah, so these. N are L zeros, right? Right, but that's like global conformal transformation. Now there is some Laplace. Oh, so, so, so there is, okay, I guess, uh, so there is also another point. So the point is like this C lambda K, only the, so this C lambda K seats inside, when I say seats inside V zero, like I slightly lie because there is a part which sits inside V0, which is L2 gamma slash Z. But when you consider the representation, you also consider the descendants. Mm. And those descendants sits inside Vn. Right, 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 right. So, so to be very precise, you have this Vn and V0. And then basically some of the Vns goes inside. So some of the VNs goes inside this, if these are holomorphic, if these conditions are met. And if these conditions are not met, then those VNs goes as a descendant of this in sitting inside this thing. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. So you have to think of it as a whole packet. So in, 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 in this packet, you have the Laplacian eigenfunctions and all the, things that you can get by acting L1 and L minus one. So there is a whole tower of things. Mm -hmm. And here, and in, in this case, you can go up and go down. There is a no notion of lowest rate and highest rate inside this. So, so for the C lambda K, you have, uh, you have this whole tower of things where you can go up and down and one of them is related to the L2 space, L2 gamma slash H. And for this DN and DN bar, you cannot go infinitely up or infinitely down. You, there is a lowest rung, and that tells you that it is related to the holomorphic forms, the lowest weight and the highest weight. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's see. Thanks. It's still written. Yeah, I haven't really got any clear idea about this. Comp uh, sorry, continuous um, uh, functions or continuous, we can but it's yeah. Right. So, so, so uh, just to make it more clear, so, so that you can also think of this way that in the continuous case, the spectrum is on the on the. It looks like this, and the lambda is is related to delta times one minus delta. So all the things that lives on this on. In, is inside the C lambda k. The, the scaling dimension is, is on this half plus it line. And here the scaling dimension delta is in basically. So there's a distinct difference in terms of scaling dimension. You can also think of that way. Okay, okay, thanks. Uh, is this related to the Liouville CFT, the irrational? Uh, I yeah, I wouldn't. I, I would say that it is more, it is simpler than a CFT in some 
sense because at the end of the day, when you are looking at C lambda k, as I, I was saying, that it's a, it's a simple problem of a solving a Schrodinger equation on a on a on on the surface. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So so it, it's it's a way more simpler setup of the actual CFT, but you have all the notion of OPs and everything. Okay, how much time do I have, by the way? Um, do you think you can wrap up like within five minutes? Yeah, uh, yeah, I can try. Yeah. Okay, don't worry if you need more time. Okay, let's see. So, so, so now the now now the, as I was saying, there there should be a notion of product expansion, which is basically a point-wise multiplication, where you take these functions f1 and f2 and then you can basically project onto this different area so you take this multiplication this means a projection this is a projection to identity this is a projection to discrete series this is a projection to discrete this is a projection to discrete holomorphic this is projection to discrete anti-holomorphic and this is a projection to the continuous series and then you have a notion of associativity which is basically associativity in the functional multiplication like if you evaluate f1, f2, f3, then either you can do f1, f2 first and then with f3, or you can do f2, f3 first and then with f1, and both of them should give you the same result. And this is what leads to the notion of associativity and the notion of crossing symmetry. So finally, we construct the operators which can be constructed, which can be constructed in the coherent state manner. So basically you take a state, if basically you take a lowest weight vector, which is F in A. So now your F in A basically is lowest weight. And then you act by this operator, exponential Z L minus one. And note that the, this Z is an auxiliary space time this Z has nothing to do with the original surface. So this, this is Z some that we introduce at this point. And once you do this, you construct some operator, which is which we define as script O and A. And this operator is labeled by this emergent space Z. And the idea is that because I know how my L1, L minus one and L zero acts on this capital F, I also know how L1, L minus one and L zero acts on the surface crypto. In the similar way, you can take the highest weight state and construct another operators, which is O bar. And in the same way, you know how L1, L minus one and L zero acts on this O bar. And the crucial point is that at like once you define this operator O and O bar, this exactly mimics the the operators that live that we are familiar with in the context of CFT. And the action of L0, L1, and L minus one on this operator is exactly same as the operators as like this L0, L1, and L minus one acting on the CFT operators. To be, make it more precise, we can think in as, as the scaling dimension of these operators. Once we have these operators, we can define motions of OPs and so on that we'll do in the next slide. So we can, for example, ask what happens if we take two point correlator of two holomorphic operators O and O. But now from the group theory, I know that when you take two holomorphic representation and fuse them together, you never get identity. So this is a group theory fact. And that tells you that the O two point function has to be zero. Then you can, think about the two point function of O and O bar. Then from the group theory, you know that O and O bar contains an identity. So you can write down a two point function, which has to be this, because we know that the conformal invariance tells you that it has to be a function of Z1 minus Z2 to the power two N. In the same way, you can think about a three point function, which is O, O and O bar. And again, just by conformal invariance, this exactly looks like three point function of three CFT operators. You have precisely this functional dependence and there is a three point function which depends on this O, O and O bar. 
So, so at this point, if you like, if you're a bit lost, then the thing that I want to emphasize is this following thing under the box that you can view the same object in three different ways. First of all, on the right side here, you have these holomorphic forms or the anti-holomorphic forms living on the surface. And you can define a triple overlap integral among them by multiplying them together with some proper weight factor and integrate it is over the surface and then divide by the volume of the compact surface. And that defines a number for you. The next thing is that you can take, think of these holomorphic forms and uplift to a bigger space, which is gamma slash G. Then all these forms become some functions living on here. And then you can multiply these functions pointwise on this bigger space and integrate over the bigger thing, which is gamma slash Z. That also defines the same number for you. And finally, you have these operators, which is on, on, and on bar, and you can take these operators and put them on some particular point on this auxiliary space defined by Z. And that also defines a three point coefficient, which is same as these numbers. So the point is once you go in this, once you like recast things in this language, Basically, you have the usual machinery or the usual tools of a conformal field theory. You don't have to think about these functions anymore. You can always deal with these operators. You can always deal with these OP coefficients, and you can set up a bootstrap problem. And this is precisely what we do next. We, and okay, before that, I, I was, so this is a brief snippet of the hyperbolic bootstrap. So what we did, we construct the operators labeled by points on the Riemann sphere. So this Riemann sphere is basically the emergent space. And you define, given a hyperbolic space, you define operators living on these operators labeled by these points on the Riemann sphere. And there are three kinds of objects living on the surface, the functions, the holomorphic guys, and the anti-holomorphic guys. The functions corresponds to these operators that live on this equator. The holomorphic and, and the anti-holomorphic differential forms depends like corresponds to operators that lives on the lower hemisphere and the upper hemisphere denoted here by O and O bar. And the idea is when you fuse two, two holomorphic guys, you always get holomorphic guys. When you fuse two guys from the, on the upper hemisphere of the anti-holomorphic guys, you always get back anti-holomorphic guys. But when you fuse the holomorphic with the anti-holomorphic, you get something on the equator. And, and at this point, you do not have to think about functions anymore. You can recast the whole problem in terms of the operators. And basically then you set up this, this usual bootstrap where you have, you consider the four point correlator with O, O, O bar and O bar. And, and again, you can write down in this way, which is the usual standard way. And where G is a function of a cross ratio. And then you can do the S channel expansion and the T channel expansion of this function G. And, and of course there are conformal blocks that appears here. And because the both expansion should give you the same result, you have S equals T here. And this is precisely your crossing equations. The only difference here is though, that unlike the usual CFT here, Z equals zero is a regular point. So you can take two operators and put it on top of each other. So that's a special thing that happens here. And it makes our life a little bit simpler. And, and the T-channel blocks are slightly different than the usual T-channel block in the CFT. Because in the usual case, G equals zero is not a regular point. But here, because Z equals zero is a regular point, the T-channel block is actually a linear combination of a block and the shadow block. So this function is slightly different, but still it's a hypergeometric function. And once you have this whole setup, you can basically put it on a computer, do the SDVP and put uh, rigorous bounds. Um, for the view of time, I will like keep the details of the bounds and just, just, just to tell you what kind of bounds we can produce. And, and, and I will just mention one main thing, which is like, like how can you make the bounds genus specific? And that information is encoded in this N. So 
So as I was telling you that the multiplicity of this ON, these operators are related by the riemann roch theorem. So the point is, once you know the some information about the surface, you know the signature of gamma, you can figure out how many of these operators are there. So for example, if you are looking at genus two surface, then you know the n equals one guys, there are O one A, where A is one comma two. So there are two operators with scaling dimension one for genus two. And for genus G, there will be G number of them. And this all follows from uh, this Riemann rock. So basically the idea is once you know some information about the surface, you know how many of these operators are there. And then you can set up a bootstrap problem with those many operators. And that will put a bound on, on for bound specific to that kind of surface. And this is how you can make your bound specific to either genus two or genus three or genus zero with three orbifold points and so on. And so, and these are all bounds. And for example, if you have an operator with n equals one, then you can get a bound 8.47032. And in all cases, you can see that these bounds are very nearly saturated by some known surfaces. So these bounds are remarkably exciting. And, and, and you can like, you can play the, you can also consider mixed correlated bootstrap where, so earlier here, I told you here, every operator is n, 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 but you can also consider a set of operators where some operators has scaling dimension n and some operators has scaling dimension n prime. And then you can set up a mixed correlator bootstrap problem, which will further carve out the possible spectrum. And um, I will skip these things for the time. And um, finally, here is a list of all the results we have. And um, the thing I want to mention here that uh, except for genus four and genus six, uh, in all cases, our bounds are better than the known analytic bounds. For genus four and genus six, the best known bound is still from 1980s, which is which is made by Yang Yao, so two and 1.6. And it's not very clear why the genus four and genus six is special. And this column and this column is some improvements or attempts to improve the Yang Yao bounds. And they are also able to improve the Yang Yao except for genus four and genus six. And but in all other cases, our bounds are better than this Yang Yao and this paper from last year. And finally, when the genus becomes very, very large, we can produce a bound which is 0.52, which is better than the Yang Yao bound and the bound from last year. But there is a recent analytical result and genus going to infinity limit, which shows that this bound has to be 0.25. So, which means there is a scope to do better for the bootstrap for higher genuses. And finally, as, as with the case with the spectrum, that like it is also possible to extract the spectrum if because the our bounds are nearly saturating, like from the HDBP, you can get the extremal function and plot it. And when you plot the extremal function, the first uh, zero and this gives you the rigorous bound and then there are a bunch of minimums and one remarkable observation is that these minimums actually mimic the lower eigenvalues of the zero two three seven triangle so you can compare with the uh, the numerical values which you can see that there's 142.551 which is the second non-trivial eigenvalue and the, the bootstrap gives you a extremal function, which has a minima at 142.552. So, so, the, so the point I want to make here that the bootstrap does not only give you a rigorous bound on the first eigenvalue, it also gives you a functional which can, can meaning which can, which can very nearly estimate all the low eigenvalues. In this case, it can estimate the first five non-trivial eigenvalues. And similar extremal function has been discussed in context of sphere packing also. And in those cases, people are actually figured out this function like analytically. So there is a hope that similar situation will also appear here. People can figure out these extremal functions analytically 
and that will probably give us some insight about chaotic spectrum and so on. And there are possible future directions. For, for example, one can do a mixed correlated bootstrap to produce sharper bounds at large genus. One, instead of PSL2R, one can consider SL2R, which has additional EREPs corresponding to spinner bundles living on the surface. So that's another thing. One can explore higher dimensional orbifolds. For example, we are now looking at the 3D manifolds and 3D orbifolds, where the relevant group is SO1, 3, and you can play a similar game. Then we can think about non-orientable surface where the relevant group is PSL2R, semi-direct product with Z2. And of course, there is a connection with the d seater bootstrap because at the end of the day, in both cases, the EREPs that appear is EREPs of SO1, D, which is the relevant group. So there's a lot to explore in, in future. Thank you. I'm sorry for going over time. It's okay. Thanks for the really nice talk. And uh, it's uh, really good. Um, I guess we can take still take some questions. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, know. I might have rushed in a few places, so feel free to ask questions. I have... Uh, uh... Maybe a few questions. Uh, so for me, yeah. it was de definitely a bit too fast. Uh, yeah, I, I know. But, I also but, felt that, but it, yeah, but, it's very yeah, no hard problem. to encapsulate everything in one hour. So, so if, uh, one particular thing. So, mm -hmm. um, so the the operators you construct they yeah. depended on n. Yes. And uh, so th these are always like integer. Yes. This is one thing. So uh, it seems like not to be some some very general CFT. And then you always start with yeah. uh, PSL 2R, uh, yeah. which is not the full conformal group. So the operators you construct, they are not like uh, in 2D. So they're, they are not, uh, they're not Virasoro. So they are quasi-primary. No, no, no. So, so the, the, the correspondence is that D-dimensional hyperbolic orbifold uh, is a toy model for D minus one-dimensional conformal thing. So it's, in this setup, it's just a zero plus one-dimensional like CFT setup, but it's simpler than a CFT. For example, there is no OP singularity in this case in the S channel. Ah, so the surface is not related to, to a CFT in 2D, but it's related to a to yeah, what so, exactly so, now? So these operators are uh, are now operating with what kind of theory? So so the, these operators lives on an emergent space, which is labeled by this Z. And this Z has nothing to do with the uh, with the actual surface. But Z is now real, or it's Z, some Z parameter. Can, so in our in our for the bootstrap approach, Z is real, but you can complexify it. So you can think of it as a complexified zero plus one dimensional CFT. And when I say CFT, I mean this precise definition that you have some Hilbert space of operators. You have some action of the P is of the conformal group on these operators or on these states. And you have a notion of OP. And once, and the OP satisfies the associativity. And by But, but that's, that's my, because you, so what is the, so why is it the full conformal, so why is it the conformal field theory now? Because if Z is, for example, uh, real, and mm -hmm. then it would be a conformal field theory on the real line, let's say, let's yeah. just imagine that, then yeah. the conformal symmetry is uh, huge. It's basically all reparameterizations of the real line. If you would go one dimension higher, so it would be no, 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 two no, dimensions, no. it's not only P's. So you constructed like representations of PSL2R, which is not yeah. all reparameterizations of the real line. Yeah, so when I, when I say conformal group, I really mean SO1, D, which in this case, SO1, 2, which is PSL2R, not the full thing. Yeah, that, that's kind of what I, so so you, you always consider like the, not the, the, so in the 1D, part, not the full yeah. CFT. You construct, uh, you you look at like uh, operators that uh, are like in, in 2D. These would be the quasi primaries. In 1D, yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, I agree because there is no notion of stress energy tensor here. At least there is no natural notion of stress energy tensor. Hmm. Yeah. And yeah, and I, then I, there I uh, there's this thing you use the the bootstrap. Mm -hmm. for these operators which are mm -hmm. integer and then you get some bound lambda 
Mm-hmm. Uh, this lambda is also related to a um, to a conformal dimension or not. This is I didn't fully understand that. I guess I didn't properly explain. So the so the point is that uh, so the point is in the S channel when you fuse this O N and O N, you only get guys which has scaling dimension delta equals two N plus some integer M. So in the S channel, if, the expansion is that you can see that there's a GP and P goes from 2N to infinity and mm-hmm. P is only even. But on the T channel, when you fuse the ON and ON bars, you get the guys on the principal series, which has delta equals half plus IT. And then the eigenvalues is related to lambda equals delta times one minus delta. And so basically what you are constraining on the T channel is what kind of lambdas can appear in, in this expansion. So when I write delta k here, it is basically half plus i t k. Okay. Is that clear? Yeah, no, it's clear. Yes. Thanks. So, so here the I guess the here the nice thing is that in the A channel you have tons of information because you know mm-hmm. first of all you know how many of these external operators are there because you know Riemann rock. You also know in the S channel expansion, when you fuse ON and ON, you get 2N plus M. And for each of these guys, again, you can use Riemann rock and you know how many of them are there. So in principle, you have incredible amount of control in the S channel thing. And then you can use that information to put bounds on the T channel. Okay, yeah, very good. And it seems like these bounds are super good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks. I actually have a related question to this part. And uh, so in the result, you only give number one, right? Uh, wait, what do you mean by number one? Uh, lambda, lambda. L- yeah, lambda one, yeah, yeah. Sorry, lambda one. So that means um, it's uh, some certain uh, terms in the T-channel expansion. Mm-hmm. Is the basically the yeah the first non-trivial term in this expansion? Right. It looks maybe a first derivative or something, but I'm not sure. So why? Yeah. What is the logic here that uh, you get the bound for lambda one? And uh, yeah, maybe the question should be asked like, um, so the other lambda k terms can mm-hmm. be defined or is not important here? Oh, is the usual CFT story where you have two OP channels and you basically put bounds on the on the lambda one, the first non-trivial things that appear in the OP thing in, in one of the channels. So 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 in principle, you can enlarge your source space. For example, if you are super powerful, then you can put a constraint on on, on some plane defined by lambda one and lambda two. And the bootstrap would tell you that in the lambda one, lambda two plane, there is only, sorry, in the lambda one, lambda two plane, there is some allowed region. Mm -hmm. But but the way we set up the bootstrap problem here, it basically tells you that there there is a bound on lambda one. We do not care about the value of lambda two. Okay, okay, probably some knowledge gap that I, so I, I I guess is the so you can think of it this way. So the, so the bootstrap problem tells you that. Um, so what what is the bootstrap equation? The bootstrap equation tells you that zero is something like sorry. There is an identity contribution which is positive, and then then you have some sum over f square and g delta something like that, and then then basically you normalize it in a way so that this is. So at the end of the day, I guess. I should write it clearly. So at the end of the day, you have some equations like this. And then you try to find some functional su- such that this equation can never be satisfied if delta is greater than some delta star. So the point is, so you assume some spectra and you say your first non-trivial eigenvalue is bigger than some delta star. And then you find a functional 
and show that that spectrum is never possible by using the functional. And once you show that that once you once you show that that functional once by that functional once you show that spectrum is not possible, that immediately tells you that the lowest eigenvalue has to be less than delta star. Mm -hmm. So it's exactly the same way the usual CFT thing is done, like the CFT bootstrap is done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you basically find out a functional which, which, uh, which basically violates this equation after, after you act with the functional. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess I can tell you a okay, nicer, probably this um, graph will probably tell you a nicer thing. So suppose you have this graph and the actual functional is like, so basically the actual operators live somewhere on this real line. So suppose all of your operators lives above this 44.8835. So the operators are here, 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 here. So everything will have a positive contribution from, from this side, right? Yes. Because, yes. and then you cannot add them up to get a zero. That's right. And that means you precisely have to something inside it so that this negative contribution cancel out all the positive contribution. And that precisely tells you that there has to be an operator that sits here. Because if all the operator sits on this side, then you can never get a zero because all these contributions are positive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a negative contribution. That means there has to be an operator below this. I see. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So that's basic, basic. Yeah. So is the general idea. Like is even in the CFT bootstrap, you basically find out a functional, which when act on your spectrum gives out a plot like this. And then the first zero here gives you a reverse bound. Okay. Okay. Very mm -hmm. I see. Thanks a lot. Yeah, sure. Um, I think probably that's all for today. So I will stop the recording. So thank you very much again. Sure. Thank you.